You know, uh, sometimes people tell you things and you know even before it finishes coming out of their mouth that it isn't true. <laughs> you know, like uh, when the government tells you when something is going to happen? Here, the construction projects, it's going to be done on this date. Nope. Or when uh, someone starts a conversation by saying, now, I'm not trying to sell you anything. <laughs> what are they trying to do? If you're on a date with someone and uh, he says, well, I'm not like all those other guys. <laughs> What's he telling you? You know, you know. But maybe more than any of them, maybe the most untrue thing that is this, is this little uh, nursery rhyme thing that we used to say when we were kids. Do you remember this one, the, the sticks and stones? Sticks and stones will break my bones. What was the next part? Did you ever know the one? It was, we had a little mix at the last service. Did you ever do the other one, though, the, the rubber and glue? Do you remember that one? Okay, see, this one has many people know. So what we used to say was, was I'm rubber and you're glue, see? So whatever you say to me, you know, it, it bounces off of me. I got more than a few things that have been said, too, about me, stuck to me, that I wish I could get rid of. Anybody? You see, we so often completely underrate the power of the words that come out of our mouth and what they do to affect, for good, yes, but especially for bad, the people around us. And the place that infects us most is not people that we barely know, it's the people that we know the most. This, we've been in a study set of messages about relationships kind of partly about romantic relationships, but really about all of our interactions between you and me. And one of the places where we most hurt each other, one of the places where things most get broken is by the things that we say. I have a dear friend, a dear friend, a person I've known for many years, and he is one of the best people that I know. And he said something to me earlier this year when I was really down that every time I hear his name, every time I see his face, he already apologized for it. He already said he was sorry. And I, and I told him I forgave him. But still, every time I see, if he walked in the back door right now, the first thing that will come to my mind is when he said, that's just the way that it is. And the message today is about the things that we say. I, I have three titles. Can, I, can we try them and we'll see which one we want to pick? <laughs> Title number one is Five Proverbs you may not be listening to. Title number three is, well, we'll save it. Title number two, maybe, maybe don't talk so much. <laughs> Title number three is just, no, just kidding, we wouldn't say that in church. Title number three is <laughs> the power of verbal restraint. The power of verbal restraint. The power, well, I'm glad it's good now. Let's hope it's still good in 45 minutes, all right? Now, the power of verbal restraint comes from Proverbs chapter 26. Nope, sorry, I'm wrong. That's the wrong. It's Proverbs chapter 10 is the first one. We got a whole bunch of them here. Proverbs chapter 10 says this. This is where this message started when I read this verse. It says this, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. So if you're a non-stop fountain of bop, 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 tweet, tweet, insta, insta, comment, comment, bop, uh, 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 eventually, one of them, that one, is going to be evil in the sight of God and is going to hurt some people around you. But the person who could say and doesn't say, the person who wants to say and doesn't say, the person who has every right in the world to say but doesn't say, is prudent. Prudent doesn't just mean like, in God's eyes, it's a good idea. Prudent means you're saving yourself a whole bunch of headaches when you choose not to say. The power of verbal restraint. 
So we're going to have five Proverbs that I'm going to show you, and I'm hoping that each one is going to unlock for us a little bit how much our relationships would improve if we said quite a bit less. I would suggest to you, in fact, that what we choose not to say is often our greatest victory in the sight of God, and what we say without thinking is often our biggest regret. What we don't say is often our greatest victory, and what we say is often our greatest regret. This is from the book of Proverbs, all of them. Proverbs are sayings. Problems are generally true points of wisdom for living. Proverbs are not to be taken hyper-literally, but are to be understood. They're all, mostly all written by Solomon, who we know from Scripture is the wisest man who ever lives. He wrote a handbook for living. This is the book of Proverbs. But they shouldn't be taken hyper-literally. They're not promises. Proverbs are not promises. They're suggestions for wise living. Sometimes you have to even see them that sometimes they give us different sides of the same issue. As an example, look at this verse, Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. It says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. But answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So which is it? Should you answer a fool or not answer a fool? Should you answer a fool or not answer a fool? You see? What's the point? The point is, it depends on the situation. This is Proverbs. It shows us wisdom. These are ideas that when we understand them, and so all over the book of Proverbs, there is someone you want to be and someone you don't want to be. You don't want to be the fool. Whenever the fool is being talked about, it should be screaming at you out of the text, don't be like this. But you want to be the heart of wisdom or the wise son, depending on which place it's written. And so these are written for us to help us understand. So here's five of them. Let me show you the first one. Proverbs 18.2. This is the first part. We're calling this part Stop Yapping. Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding. You see it? But only in expressing his opinion. And all the ladies are in the house are happy that was framed like it's a man who's this fool. <laughs> A fool, now that word pleasure, a fool takes no pleasure, is the idea of delight or the moment of wow. You see, what happens for the wise person is the wise person loves the feeling of coming to a place of understanding. I was here in this room most of this week in a conference with Bishop and a whole bunch of people, and I had these moments all through of it where something that I didn't understand and something else I didn't understand and something else I didn't understand, the speakers were bringing it all kind of locked into place and I had that, that light bulb moment, the, oh man, okay, yeah. The fool doesn't even like when that happens. Because they are, the fool, not interested in your opinion or your knowledge or your experience. The fool only likes one thing. Do you know what the fool likes? The fool likes when it's their turn to talk. So if you're in a conversation with the fool, here's what they're doing. You and me. Now, I'll, okay, but here, yeah, you, come on, come on. But, but I'll be the fool, because, you know, you're, you're a decent sized guy, so that's all I'm saying. So if you and me are, come here, so, so if you and me are having, if you and me are having a conversation, and, and you're the wise man, and I'm the fool. Okay, yes, thing, okay. Now, when the wise man and the fool are having a conversation, the whole time you're talking, do you know what I'm doing? Am I listening? No. Am I understanding? No. I'm thinking about the words that I'm going to start spewing when you give me like a millisecond of an opening. <laughs> so you're just, you're talking, you're saying, son, you know, I really see that you should this, you know, and, and I, you know, and this, and then in the moment you just pause for a breath. But you know what I really think is? <laughs> Without any, thank you, any sense of understanding. The fool takes no pleasure and sometimes we hurt our relationships, we break people close to us when we develop the pattern of only talking and never listening, of only giving thoughts and never receiving thoughts. I could be talking here about a husband and a wife together for a long time, 
Could be talking about husband and wife together for a short time, just over that honeymoon period where they find out that kissing isn't going to get them for a lifetime together. It's going to take more than that. All right. I could be talking about parents and young people that are now into college or growing up, and now the way that our relationship works needs to change. It can't just be mom and dad telling me I don't know anything anymore. Sometimes we only want to say we don't want to understand. It reminds me of a, of a story when my wife and I, she's here. When we were dating, uh, remember this like it was yesterday, we were dating one night, uh, she said a word, and uh, I said, well, you're not, you're not saying that, right? And I'll show you, that this is the definition of the word. So you'll get it in a second. This is a word that means having an irritable disposition, cantankerous, difficult to deal with or control. Apparently in the Midwest, it also can mean to have a playful tendency to cause trouble. This is word, and this word means having an irritable disposition to be difficult to deal with. And she said the word, and I said, you're not saying that, right? No, no, you say it like this. And she said, well, I appreciate that you have that thought, oh, my boyfriend, but you are wrong. No, no, no. You say it like this. We were pronouncing it different. And I said, you know, you're beautiful in everything, and I'm so excited to be dating you, but you're wrong. We went back and forth and back and forth. It got mad, mad, mad. And the word is ornery, which can also be pronounced ornery. And we both became it in our argument with each other about how to say it. And just let, for, for the, so the record's clear, that was 15 years ago or more, and she was right, and I was wrong. And that's the way that story gets told. See that? Stop yapping. Listen. Listen. Both ears, not just the words, but what they're trying to say. You might be surprised at how much joy you could bring to someone you love by slowing the words down and turning up the listening. Second, stop venting your raw feelings. Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool, again, do you want to be the fool? Says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit. But a wise man quietly holds it back. The idea there of full vent is all your breath or the entirety of your feelings. This verse is saying the foolish person pours out their feelings, all of them, all the time, on all the people around them. And this was written before social media. <laughs> the foolish person pours out their feelings all the time, all over, whoever they're talking to. But the wise person holds it back. The point isn't whether the feelings are right or not. The point is you don't really know if your feelings are right or not while you're feeling them so strong right now. The fool is the person who has a very small gap between feeling it and saying it, thinking it and saying it, it coming to their mind and it exploding off of their keyboard into outer space. The fool is the person who always thinks it's time to say what they're thinking and feeling. But the wise person holds it back. Jesus, John chapter two, this is a very interesting verse. Jesus, it says that Jesus did not entrust himself to man because he knew what was in the heart of man. You see, most people can't handle hearing everything you're thinking and feeling. Most people just can't handle it. And if they actually knew all the things rolling around in that head of yours, and so sometimes it's just a, take a breath, wait a second. I've like almost never in my life deeply regretted the thing that I didn't say when I was angry, hurt, frustrated, upset. There are just not that many people. Now, there are people who can handle here in your whole self. They are few and they should be treated and treasured. This poem actually perfectly describes them by the poet Dinah Craig. Listen to this. This is about what that person is like, the person who's actually true and can handle who you really are. Oh, the comfort 
the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person. Having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but pouring them all right out, just as they are, chaff and grain together, certain that a faithful hand will take and sift them, keep what is worth keeping, and then with the breath of kindness blow the rest away. You maybe get like three people like that in your life. And everybody else, you're going to hurt them and hurt yourself and hurt your reputation and hurt your future and hurt all kinds of things if when it comes to your mind, you just have to pour it out on top of everybody. So stop yapping. Stop venting. There's going to be great news by the end, by the way. Don't worry. Number three is stop shaming. Listen to this one. Proverbs 11, 12 and 13 says this. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. But a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. You see, so the idea of the neighbor here is not like the person you never talk to who lives next door, like maybe in the world that we live in, in this society that's being written here, that your neighbor, these are your friends. You have your little circle of people that are right near you. And the idea is, so if you go around telling your neighbor's business, criticizing them for this and that and the other thing, you are not wise. If you go about slandering, saying, exaggerating, making more of it than what is actually there, no. The trustworthy person keeps things covered. Love, love covers sin. Love covers sin. Love doesn't want everyone to know everything that you know. Love says, well, maybe I'll just take that dumb thing they did or said, just put it in my pocket, zip it up, and never tell anybody about it. But that's not the way we are. And, well, this, you know, well, the thing is, sometimes we're talking about a topic, and I, you can say, you know, us church folks, we're a lot better. Yeah, but this one. Did you see what she was wearing in the choir? I mean, you know it's because Bishop wasn't going to be here, and she, you know, she would never have done anything like that. Did you see the way their kids were acting up? Did you see what they let their kids, they, did you see what they let their kids dress up as for Halloween? Did you see those, those devil costumes? Did you know I heard, I heard, I saw them at the movies on a Sunday. Did you know? I, well, I just, I just, did you hear the music they're letting their kids listen to? Did you, did you know that they're splitting up? They are, do you know? And I know why. Do you know why? You won't believe what he did. Come here over here, let me tell you. Do you know what he did now? Can you, she's getting married already? Didn't it just, didn't it just go, wait, didn't it just, wait, 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 now wait a second, now wait a second, now wait a second. See, and this is so great because I'm brand new and I don't know any of y'all. So I'm not talking about any of this stuff. I just say, that's just the way we, we are. We just, we go about. We go about. You feel free to stop me if I'm not telling the truth. I, and I'm, I'm one of them. And you're one of them. And we're one of them. That there's this thing in us that we love to climb just a little higher by pulling someone around us down with our words. And it feels so small and so innocent in a moment. But I tell you, there is nothing that hurts quite so much like finding out that a couple people were talking about you when you weren't around. Because you, know, you would have never said that to their face. You know you wouldn't have. You wouldn't have. Not like that you wouldn't have. You would have wrapped it all up in your nice Christianiness, you know. And don't even get me started about when people do it as a prayer request. You know that one. Now, I just think, I just, we just need to pray. We just need to pray for sister so-and-so. Because I heard about this guy that she's been going with, and it's just, well, you know, we've gone down this path before, and we just need, we just. Whoo, whoo, yeah. Well, okay, maybe, maybe just do that one in your prayer closet without having to tell your whole Bible study group, you know. We find it so easy, don't we? 
we find it so easy to take whatever's happening with somebody else to kind of create space for ourselves. And when we do, we hurt our relationships. Something I learned the hard way in my life is that you know that if, if you and me are talking, me and Pastor JP are talking, and we're talking about Pastor George, you know that the moment Pastor JP walks away, the first thing that comes to his mind is, I wonder what Luke says to Pastor George when I'm not around. You like, I like the when people say, now, can I, can I tell you? But, but you don't tell anybody. So what they're saying is, can you be a better person than I am right now? Will you promise that you'll be better? They won't. They won't. So what are we saying? What we're saying is, we use our words and it hurts each other. It hurts. It hurts. I, I don't know if you grow out of it, but it hasn't come close to happening for me yet. The words that people close to you say can hurt, especially if you're not around. The wise person doesn't reveal secrets. They don't use the things that happen to lower their opinion of someone else. The wise person says, he was having a real bad day, and I'm so thankful that he said that to me. Because you know what I can do? I can just forget he ever said it and make sure no one ever knows that. He was having a bad day, and I'm just going to turn it down. We got two more. Proverbs 15.1. Stop fighting fire with fire. Proverbs 15.1 says... A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. In a moment of relational tension, maybe you're in a marriage where occasionally there's a disagreement. I, I couldn't speak to that myself, but... A soft answer turns away wrath. And the reason why that's so difficult is sometimes, especially if there's a power dynamic in the relationship, you've just had enough. And so sometimes you say, you know what, the next time that boss of mine walks in here with all that, he's going to hear from me. So I'm just going to try to stand up just as tall as I can and get my voice down in the lowest register I can. I'm going to say, not this time. Why don't you go get your own coffee? Or whatever the thing might be. And the thing about that is it feels real good for like a second. And then you're looking for a new job. <laughs> which is, I guess, good for Pastor George's job check. But for the rest of it, it's... it's you know, you get people and it's like, well, yeah, so you've had, let me get, okay, so in the last three years you've had seven jobs and at every one of them it didn't work out because your boss hated you? Well, I, you know, I didn't go to Harvard, but I, it seems as though you may be the, the common denominator. And the point of a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up. It has nothing to do with being right. It has nothing to do with being right. It has everything to do with sometimes the calmer, quieter, more patient person is giving a great gift to the person struggling with those things because they create space for the relationship to continue, not continue boiling things up till the point of explosion. Now notice also that a soft answer is still an answer. A soft answer is still an answer. You should never hear something like what I'm talking to right now and think that it means that if you're being abused or if you're being treated improperly or if you're being treated in an illegal way that you should just take it. No. If someone is doing something illegal, you should call the police. If someone is abusing you, you should call the church or somebody who can help you. A soft answer is still an answer. It just means that at the moment where tensions are rising, the wise person says, you know what I'm not going to do is fight fire with fire. When I fight fire with fire, you know what we just make? More and bigger fire. Hmm. Sometimes what a soft answer is, and it's contained in that word, the idea of the soft answer, contains the idea of listening to the point of understanding. You know, one of the reasons people get so frustrated sometimes is not because the person they're talking to doesn't agree. It's because the person they're talking to doesn't even understand. You have to understand first before you can even decide if you agree or disagree. 
And this, sometimes you just make the people around you crazy because you won't stop long enough to even hear what they're saying. You jump right to what you think you heard the last three times you had this disagreement. And so a soft answer turns away wrath, but a, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And where we get the inspiration for this reality is amazing. Do you know that Jesus personified this perfectly? 1 Peter 2 says that when Jesus Christ was reviled, when he had accusation after accusation after accusation after accusation thrown at him, do you know what Jesus didn't do? The scripture says Jesus didn't respond in kind. Jesus had all of the right on his side. If you're arguing with Jesus, bad idea. <laughs> but even though he was right, he was willing to surrender his rights for the sake of those he loved, which is why we're here today, you see? And so often we get so up in our mind about, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. But do you know that you can be wrong in the way you're right? Just because you have the facts on your side doesn't mean you are in the correct position. In fact, if you're wrong in the way you're right, you're wrong even if you're right. Because the highest law in the Christian faith is not the law of truth. The highest law is the law of love. And sometimes you can be saying words that are accurate in a way that punishes and hurts someone in a way that you are the one who's wrong. There's more to it than just, there's more to it than just the simple facts. And sometimes we get so up on the, well, I can prove to you, I got you this time. Okay, so great. Is it worth losing that relationship over? Is it worth hurting that person over just to show that you got it? I've always been reminded of Jesus, you know, when uh, Peter denies Jesus three times. And there's this brilliant scene in John 21. It's maybe my favorite thing in the whole scripture. And Jesus shows back up on the scene. He's going to have a conversation with Peter. And I mean, Jesus is right, like always. And he could have just stood up there and said, now, Peter, I told you you were going to do it. And you did it anyway. And you still haven't said you're sorry. And, and you're going to do it again because you're a this and you're a that. And I've been trying to, he could have just laid it down on him. And would Jesus have been within his rights to do so? Yes, but Jesus doesn't do that. In fact, he calls Peter away from the group. John kind of tags along behind, because you know, classic John and Peter, they're always kind of competing with each other. So John stands close enough to kind of write it down, which is how we know about it now from the Bible. But <laughs> Jesus' plan was to bring Peter all the way over here. You see, love, love never wants to shame, ever. It is never in the mind of love to make the mistake that you made an opportunity for everybody else to have a lower opinion of you. Love is always in the interest of saying, okay, now, this thing, we gotta, we gotta deal with it. And we gotta deal with it real. And Jesus doesn't fall down on the truth. He is the truth. So if Jesus is doing it, it's the truth. But Jesus goes out of his way to put Peter back together in a way that allows Peter to still, just a few chapters later, be the leader of the church that changes the whole world. And so often we fight fire with fire and it breaks things. Last one, Proverbs 18, 17. It says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Now, I, I got to have you because we're going to take this through the end of the message today. You got to get this one word. It's the most important one to me there. Just put it back up for just a second. The one who states his case first, right there. Say it. All right, now I'm going to keep doing it until you obey. Now, come on now. Now, the one who states his case first seems right until the other one comes and examines him. The one who states his case first seems. I, uh, I had happened to me this week, like one of the worst things that can happen to a person in the world of 2019, which is that my Instagram got hacked. And 
now I'm locked out and I can't see what all the people in my life are doing that's gonna make me feel like sad that I'm not doing as cool of a thing as they're doing. And I, I have nowhere to post pictures of myself trying to be a good parent and all that, you know. And, I, and so I don't, I'm locked out and I can't get back in. And it's just, it's, it's I just, I, I, I just, I just, it's just. And the reason I was thinking about it is that the other, this happens all the time, I'm a household, I have three boys at home. Uh, they're all in elementary school. And my whole life is like this. I'm sitting over here, scanning, you know, looking at my Instagram, when they're off in another room doing something. So now I guess I'm reading the Bible in the story now, because I'm hacked and I'm out. And, and I'm uh, just trying to be straightforward. And so, so I'm here and I'm just minding my own business. And then you always hear it first. Dad, 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 dad. You hear him first, then you see him. Okay, buddy, what happened? Well, okay, so I didn't slap him in the face. <laughs> Carter, Carter, he took the ball from me and he was holding it like this and I was just trying to grab the ball. I was just trying to grab the ball and then when I was trying to grab the ball, well, my hand, my hand, well, my, my hand hit his face. But then it was him, he, he wouldn't give me the ball. He was, and then just about then, the next one, Dad, 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 no, 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 that's not what happened. No, 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 no. It was, it was my turn to play with the ball, and I was just playing with the ball, and then he just slapped me in the face, dad. You know, and it's like that, because they're both yelling, so you can't hear anything, just noise. And then right about then, the third one. No, dad, no, 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 this is the younger brother, and so the younger brother always does the same move. No, dad, no, no, they were being mean to each other. They, he slapped him, he took the ball, and I think they should both go to their room, and I'm gonna go play with the ball. It's always the same. And, and if you think that I'm telling that story pretty well, it's because I live that story like three times an hour, every day, forever. That's the way, if you have, it's just the way they, and I never taught them this verse. But they learned somewhere along the way that in human nature, the one who states his case first, the one who states his case first seems right. Now, does seeming right mean they are right? No, you know, I, and this is where I, I do like the Solomon thing, you know, like he says, cut the baby down the middle. That's the Solomon thing that he says when he gets, and it's always the same. Okay, I, everybody go to your room. Because you can never figure it out. And they're all wrong and they're being, you know, whatever. It's the way it is. The one who states his case first seems right. And we should be careful, you and me, that every time someone runs up to us trying to tell us something, before we start listening to what they're saying, before we start listening to what they're saying, before we start listening to what they're saying, we should start with this question, why do you want me to know that? And what are you hoping I'm going to do because I know that? Every time someone's trying to make you mad, it's because they want you to do something buy their product, get mad at that person, whatever the thing may be, there is a lot there. So before you start saying, okay, getting all riled up about the information that you're being told about that person, about that company, about that whatever, this and that whatever, you know, you, before that, let's just start here, why, 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 why? Why, 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 why do you want me to know that? Because the one who states his case first seems right. I remember uh, when I was in Chicago and I was a pastor, Every so often you'd have somebody come to church and they would rush up after the, the service and they would want to tell you, the first thing out of their mouth, they would want to tell you the thing that was wrong with the church that they used to go to. Well, you don't know the pastor. I, you know, this, he, uh, you know, this. And we developed this little thing. We would all start just going like this. And the person would be like, what, what are you doing? What, 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 what are you doing? Well, I'm just setting my watch for the day when you're gonna be talking to some other pastor and saying the same things about me. The one who states his case first seems right. And you know, we use our words and we don't always use them properly and a lot of times we use them and we hurt ourselves and we hurt the people that we love. And my suggestion to you is that there is great power 
in verbal restraint. There is great power in verbal restraint. When you could, choosing not to. When maybe you really, really, really want to. There's some people that need to go home and they need to just keep like the sink full of water and you sometimes just need to throw your cell phone in there (laughs) rather than to say the thing that you want to just pop off and say to the person. Because those things, they cause so much damage. And just because it seems like a good idea doesn't mean it is a good idea. And we get our inspiration and our understanding for this principle from the Lord Jesus Christ, too. When he was put on trial, was convicted. And it seemed like justice. But just because it seems like justice doesn't mean it was. There's always injustice inside any system of justice. And so Jesus was... He was convicted, and it seemed like to the people around, you know, it seemed like, well, he was convicted. I guess that's it. And then he was presented before the people, and it was like, should we pick Barabbas or should we pick Jesus? And it seemed like, it seemed like to the people, Barabbas. And so then it it seemed like it was the right thing to do to beat and to whip and to crush and to put into great pain our Lord Jesus. It seemed like it was the right thing to do, so they did it. He bled and he was in pain. And so then it it seemed like the right thing to do to put him on the cross. And he bled and died. Not because of the mean, harsh things that somebody over there somewhere said in another state or county, but because of the things you and I have done and said. And then it, it seemed like he was dead. No, 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 no. All Friday, they went to bed thinking, it seems like it's over. And then, I always think that must have been the worst day of all the days. Wake up Saturday morning and he, he, he's gone. It seems like it's, it's done. And all Saturday. And then they went to bed Saturday and it seemed like all hope was lost. But I know you know the next part. But early... But early, but early Sunday morning, the first thought was it seems like something is wrong here because the tomb, well, the stone is gone and Peter and John run over. John, of course, has to note in the scripture that he made it there first. (laughs) And they go in and something's wrong because it seems like someone stole, it seemed like someone stole the body. But then all of a sudden it didn't seem like anything anymore. He was, is, still alive. Alive. And every time it seems to us like the best course of action, like every time it seems to us like the best course of action is to pop off and to say something that we want to say to another person in a moment, we're supposed to remember that Jesus endured all of that condemnation and now he's alive. Because he won, we can win too. And so today, wherever it is that has found a place of conviction for you, we simply must, for the sake of those we love, for the sake of those we love, not treat our words like something other than what they actually are, which is a weapon and a weapon that can be used to bless or can be used to curse, a weapon that can be used to praise or a weapon that can be used to condemn. Our words are a weapon, and we must, must, must use them for what they are for, which is proclaiming that Jesus is alive.